Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming back. Um, uh, I first want to thank uh, John and the Journal and the Review and Alec and Michelle and Elizabeth and Katie um, and Betsy and Marcos as well. But thank you for arranging this. Um, this is really a singular event. Um, Svetlana, she was, as we all know, we've heard about, she was very special. Let me tell you a little bit about my experiences with Svetlana before I get into my presentation about something that was very important to her. And the very first time I ever thought about it or, or, uh, or ever heard about it, this confluence of human rights, procedural rights, and the environment. Let me tell you about it. Um, I threw a, a party, a symposium, and we call them uh, academic parties, we call them sym symposiums, um, <laughs> about uh, a dozen years ago. So it was on environmental citizen suits, and it was at Widener, and John was there, and Zig was there, and we had a, a, you know, just a great lineup of people. It was just fantastic. And I invited John because I knew John. He was uh, uh, among uh, Zig and Oliver and John, and many of you in this room, you were my early heroes. When, wait, does that make you feel old? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, one of the first environmental books, and, and of course, an uh, environmental advocate and citizen suit advocate. And so um, I invited him to come out to talk about environmental citizen suits. And um, uh, he, he's heard me tell the story. But uh, he wrote back, and, and he accepted. He said he'd be delighted. He was very gracious and very generous. Uh, and I thought, that's great. OK, we have John Bonine. And, uh, and then he wrote back, and he said, um, uh, is there any way that you can also event, uh, or invite my colleague uh, Svetlana Krevchenko, and I, I, I waited for a day or so because I didn't know. I looked, you know, I Googled her at the time, or the Google equivalent, you know, for 12 years ago, and, and I, I, th I think my question was, who's <laughs> Svetlana Krevchenko? I'd never heard of her, you know? And then I was thinking, okay, the, the, the exact same conversation was happening between, or had already happened between John and Svetlana, where she had said to John, who's Jim May? <laughs> you know, why would I want to go out to Widener? Um, but she came out, and it was just one of those electric moments. You know, you meet people, uh, and, and again, she's been described by others, and I, I won't, won't do it justice at all, but, you know, a few people in your life that you meet, would they make you feel like they are listening to what you're saying? And they are understanding you, and they care about you. You know, like uh, Desmond Tutu has that quality, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, the other people you can think of, I'm sure that you know, they, they shake your hand, they look in time, and, they, and, they, and, and it's, it's as if you're, it's a magical moment with another human being. And Svetlana was like that for me, the very first time I met her. Um, I, I, again, I'd never met her before. I still remember it, John. You, know, you introduced me to her, and, and she had me at, um, at, at, at this. Um, Hello, Jean. It, it is so nice to meet you. I, I mean, I can the accent, right? But I just fell in love with her. She was just great. And uh, she made me feel that way, and she electrified the audience at the conference um, at Widener. And at first, I felt like I was almost doing John a favor. But I never told her that before. I thought, okay, you know, of course, it's fine, you know. And then I came to realize early on um, that John had done me a great favor. Uh, Svetlana was like, she was like a, a taper against the sun, you know, like, a, like, like holding up um, a matchstick against the sun, only she was brighter than it. Um, she, uh, you know, she wasn't afraid, as you, as you heard about, to talk truth to power. Um, she was a force for and a force of nature, and um, she, made a, you know, she made a great impression upon me. But the other thing, for those of you who didn't have a chance to meet her, um, I, just to make sure that another side of, of Svetlana has done adequate justice, and you saw some of it you know, like in the video, she was awesome. I mean, she was hilarious. She was vivacious. She didn't take herself too seriously. Um, and as you heard many people say, she talked to, she gave everyone the same degree of respect. You know, she, everyone that she talked to, it was just the same. She just had that natural quality to her. Um, and mostly she, uh, she, was, she was very loving. And one area of law that she loved very much, much was about participation, was about, there's my segue, was about um, procedural participation in environmental decision making. And it's come to be something that's, that's very important to me as well. And early on, I would talk to her about the Aarhus Convention and other things that I was not very familiar with. And again, she was very gracious with her time um, in light of my ignorance um, along the way. So I stand here on her shoulders. So um, this, this is something that Svetlana had something to do with as well, that public authorities hold environmental information. And the emphasis is in the original in the public interest. Um, it's not there for those who are elected, those who are appointed, uh, those who have jobs in civil service. Information about uh, decision-making is yours. It's yours as a basic human right. 
you have a right to know. Um, so my presentation has these five parts. Uh, first, some pillars of procedural environmental rights. That is the th really the three pieces that Sv Svetlana um, envisioned uh, beginning you know, decades ago about how to make, uh, really how to enliven procedural participation in environmental decision making. Second, some justifications and criticisms of procedural environmental rights. Third, uh, advancing procedural rights internationally and regionally. That's the extent to which international uh, reg regimes and conventions and protocols uh, embody procedural environmental rights and environmental decision making. Um, fourth is really what, what this part is about, is how have countries uh, manifested procedural rights and environmental decision making in their constitutions? In their constitutions. Some countries have. Not many, but some have. And so we'll talk about that phenomenon. And then lastly, this isn't a point, but it's what I've been asking several of you, Father and you, Pastor and you, like the little brother that I am over the last, you know, today and yesterday, is are these provisions worth the coin, do you think? Okay, so first, the pillars of procedural environmental rights. You have these three. These three, right? Um, everything has to come in threes, right? It, it helps remember. But first is informational rights, the rights to information. Second is the right to participate in decision making about environmental matters. Third is access to justice. That's getting into court and staying in court and getting the remedy that the court uh, issues enforced. So there are those three pieces, guys. Information, participation, and I used to call it adjudication just because it has that rhyming aspect to it, but access to justice, okay? Um, I forgot that I had this. Right here. <laughs> then I would break it. Okay. okay. So first, some justifications and criticisms of of procedural environmental rights. And by this, I don't I don't mean necessarily just participating or necessarily having as uh, or having access to information or access to the courts. This is about whether there should be special carve outs for environmental decision making. Well, there are these various uh, justifications for it. Uh, it advocates or, or it promotes openness in govern governance. Um, it promotes transparency in decision making. It promotes uh, democratic ideals, uh, if not democratic reforms. It makes those who are elected and otherwise more accountable. It uh, fulfills notions of empowerment for civil society uh, at all levels. And it ultimately, the bottom line there, the bottom point, is that it leads to legitimacy in decision making. Some criticisms. And you can come up with your own list. But that, you know, enough is enough after a certain point, right? That if you've ever been a bureaucrat or worked at a federal agency or EPA or what have you, you know, you'd feel like a lot of times there's information overload. So it can be inefficient in decision making. It can also be ineffective, that not necessarily any more information or information propagated um, leads to more effective decision making. It can be unnecessary along the way. Uh, in, in essence, if decisions are either already made or, or aren't really designed to benefit from public input. Uh, it can be medicine uh, if the participa participation is largely at the hands of those who, you know, who, who are known again as you know, the parents of the day as elites, you know, those who are educated and affluent and so on, um, instead of uh, those who might arguably most benefit from uh, better uh, uh, process in environmental decision making. It can be misused along the way, politically and otherwise. It can reveal concerns about revealing trade secrets. Um, and, and other intellectual property, and it can ultimately, bottom line, reallocate scarce, very scarce uh, government resources all along the way. Okay, now internationally, um, there, are, there is recognition of uh, the right to participate in government decision making. Now, the first two slides here aren't about environmental decision making. It's just international recognition of the value of uh, participation, the value of access to information, and the value of uh, access to justice. Of course, there's a uni uni uh, Universal Declaration on Human Rights. I think someone may, may have mentioned this earlier, that advancing uh, the, the participation advances the freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. There are various regional conventions that also recognize and embrace uh, participation, again, access to information, uh, participation, and access to justice, including the European Convention <laughs> for protection of human rights, the American Convention on Human Rights, and the African Charter of Human Rights 
uh, human and people's rights. Now, what about, about environmental decision making? What's there? Well, is there a global, I have a slide here that says Global Environmental Convention uh, to advance, that's, that's my, that's IPGEM, that's, I just made it up, trademark James R. May, September 27th, 8th, sorry, 2012. But uh, it's to advance uh, information, participation, and access to justice in environmental matters. Okay, like it? Is that gonna, that's, that, does that have legs or not? Probably not, right? Okay, so no, there's no global accord. Sorry. Um, so what about what happened 20 years ago in Rio? Was there an agreement on a global accord? No. Um, Montevideo? No. Rio plus 10? No. Rio plus 20? No. Last month? No. Uh, UNEP has come close where it's, it has uh, just, uh, it just seems like yesterday to me, but a couple, you know, it's 18 months ago now, but it, it did um, publish principles for development of national legislation for information, participation, and access to justice in environmental matters. So really guidelines for how countries might uh, embed these notions in their legislation, not in their constitutions, but in their in national legislation. Elizabeth, how much time? How, how are we doing? Just let me know. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, is, uh, all right. So, um, so when is the, you know, where do we see these, uh, th these aspects actually refre reflected in international regional agreements? Uh, and you guys know, guys know this is the thing, and this is Svetlana, and one of the reasons I'm interested, one of the reasons uh, that, that uh, this makes it such an exciting field at the Confluence of International Environmental and Human Rights Law, the Aarhus Convention. I mean, if you don't know, uh, uh, this is what I get, yeah, this is one of those, you know, like an underserved um, indie band or something that only a few people know about. The Aarhus Convention, more and more people know about it over time. I mean, it's a fascinating document. Um, it, it, it provides for, it requires, and really, I mean that word. It's the opposite. It requires uh, that countries provide access to information and environmental decision making. Yes, there are carve outs and there are procedures and whatnot, but it's, it's a hard international regional agreement. Um, it requires countries to provide for participation in environmental decision making. And then, one provision, that the third piece of this that was so near and dear to Svetlana, who served as co chair on the committee, is uh, it, it has a compliance committee. So, it has a, it has a, a means, not just the words. It has a means for accessing justice. And here, there's a, it's a, it's a tribunal. Uh, so if you have concerns, one has concerns about a country not adequately providing uh, access to information or participation uh, or uh, access to the courts in their country, then you can go to the compliance committee with a complaint. Um, it applies to the, to the countries that signed on, signed on to the Arthur's Convention. Right now, that stands at 44. Uh, along with the uh, European Union. It does not include, surprisingly enough, surprise, surprise, the United States, uh, Canada, most of the global south, uh, and, and um, another surprising facet is the, uh, so the indirect effects of Aarhus. Um, every country that signed on to Aarhus either had or has enacted now uh, legislation uh, to provide for information, participation, and access to justice in environmental matters as a means of implementing and, and uh, applying arms. Okay, so um, now in the absence of international accords and international conventions on a global scale and, and, and for uh, two thirds of the, the world on the regional scale and whatnot, what about constitutions? What about constitutions? Domestic constitutional instantiation of rights in procedural decision making to information to participation and to access to justice. Now, this is something that I'm, I'm stealing a little bit from what John Bonine said yesterday, and I won't put it again as eloquently or as elegantly as he did, but this is radical participation. Um, and radical in the nicest sense of the word. You know, this is a way of um, providing, um, you know, empowering the public to be a, a part of environmental decision making so that there can be better legislation, there can be better outcomes, there can be better discourse among and between countries along the way, and at conferences like this, right? Um, so there are, uh, there has been a phenomenon of about the last 40 years of countries embedding, consti embedding constitutionally environmental rights. Um, now, surprisingly enough, most of these are at the substantive level. About 75 countries, although you get different counts from different people, and other, but somewhere between 60 and 95. About 75 countries have a substantive rights provision. Did you realize that? Seven, you know, 75, so um, it's coming close to half of all the constitutions in the world 
recognize a fundamental right to a quality environment. Let me say that again. It's approaching half the countries in the world uh, recognize a fundamental right to a quality environment. Uh, that's, that's really been revolutionary. Um, about three quarters of the world in those constitutions have policy provisions like uh, that every environmental impact shall be considered or every citizen has, has a duty to protect the environment. But I'm focusing on what's in green there on the bottom are those provisions that specifically provide for those three pillars, or just one of them, maybe two of them, a few, all three of them, rights to information, participation, and access to justice in environmental decision making. All right, so on the, uh, the first pillar, there are about 15 uh, constitutions that have those provisions. The second, about 12, and the third, about 12. And this is just by my count, so you, you can have your own count. Uh, that I, and I'd love to hear what that is if you've been doing this kind of work uh, on a project uh, of your own. So the gold standard might be uh, a constitution out of Iceland. Uh, and this one has all three pieces. That the public authorities shall inform the public, the public authorities shall provide information, uh, the law shall secure the rights of the public to have the opportunity to participate, uh, and uh, people have to have the right to access to justice. Um, so this has everything, you know, it's, it, it's, it's all there, you know, all, all nutritional food groups are in this Icelandic provision. Only it's a draft. So, not yet. Um, all right, so what about constitutional rights to information about environmental matters? Now, those of you who have, uh, who have been in the room with me before, um, I, I get, in, 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 you know, after a while, there's an audience participation component, right, John? So you know, you know what's coming, you don't have to do this, you can sit there, but just for the first one, who would like to read the Albanian provision aloud? Because sometimes, just sometimes, things don't exist until you say they do, all right? So that's the idea. Why just listen to this guy, you know, this same guy talk for 15 minutes, um, hear from each other. So how about somebody in the back, in the back row, the Albanian, pr uh, the, uh, anybody? Michelle? <laughs> That's the best answer I've ever had. What do you want me to do? Just read the, Al the Albanian... <laughs> it is after lunch, right? Um, the Albanian constitution says no, what? Go ahead, Michelle. Everyone has the right to be informed about the status of the environment and its protection. Excellent. Okay. Everyone. Everyone. Not only citizens, not certain kinds of citizens, you know, everyone, all right? And that's a, that's a provision that provides for uh, access to information. There are uh, uh, about um, 14 other countries that have similar provisions. Chechnya, Eritrea, France, Georgia, Moldova, Montenegro, and others. So these are access to information. I end with the Russian Federation. Everyone shall have the right to a favorable environment and reliable information about its condition. A similar provision from the Ukraine. Second, there are also about a dozen provisions that ensure participation in environmental governance constitutionally. Or I should say, I don't, I don't want to say ensure because that's not really what's going on, but they, they recognize uh, participation in environmental matters, uh, including Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and others. Wait, let me go up one. Um, so, um, Finland. Carlos, so, Carlos can read Colombia. Carlos. Oh, wait. Yeah, Carlos. Every individual has the right to enjoy a healthy environment. The law will guarantee the community's participation in the decisions that may affect it. So you can see the operative board is participation. It, it's not uh, through innuendo. Um, it's, it, it, there it is. Uh, a constitutionally enforceable provision in the Colombian Constitution. Third, uh, access to justice. And these have different flavors. Um, some of them are about compliance, some are about standing, some of them are about other things. But some which include uh, uh, matters concerning compliance, include those from Angola, uh, Chile, Costa Rica, Kazakhstan, Kenya, Madagascar. And how about the Kenyan? Uh, some in the back row, or the second to last row. If you would please do me the favor of reading the Kenyan provision. Go ahead, thank you. Every person has the right to a clean and healthy environment, which includes the right to apply support for redress of damage to the environment. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so those are about standing. Then there are provisions about remedies. Thank you. Um, that provide the remedies, you know, that you can enforce um, compliance orders from courts, you know, the citizens who otherwise uh, are, are trying to take advantage of these provisions, um, including uh, from Chechnya. So who'd like to read the Chechen provision? This might be the last one. Go ahead, thank you. So catch this, a remedy, not just a remedy, but the specific kind of remedy, compensation in the Constitution. I mean, can you imagine how much fun it would be to litigate here in the United States if our Constitution had a provision that provided for compensation? Uh, maybe not in my lifetime, which brings me to the United States. Now how about uh, constitutional provisions that provide for participation, information, access to justice at the federal level? Of course you know that would be the 28th Amendment, um, ensuring that every American has the, I'm just making that up. No, well, we don't have anything like that. We also, at the statutory level, however, there are various embodiments of public participation and access to information, and to some extent, access to justice. Um, as Betsy mentioned earlier, uh, we have the National Environmental Policy Act, but also specific environmental laws have provisions that provide for or in advance public participation. Um, Congress took up a bill two years ago, and again, last year, to provide information about hydraulic fracturing, which is a huge issue uh, east of the Mississippi, and it didn't go anywhere. Um, but, but there are general provisions in the Administrative Procedure Act and, of course, in the FOIA law uh, that, that uh, provide for means for, this, for, for the public, for you, for me, to get information about decision-making in environmental matters. But that's not all. So I need about one more minute, okay? That's not all. Some states have provisions that embody either rights to information, or participation, or access to justice. Few, but some do, including Hawaii and Illinois. Now, I won't have you read that. I, I would if I had more time, because that's fun for me. Um, but these are provisions that arguably are enforceable. There's just no case law about it, so go make it. Um, if you want to read more about these subjects, we have these uh, I published. Uh, if you want to email me, I'm happy to send you links. Uh, we can get to these questions later. That's me standing by the, the First Amendment expression area. Um, I forget exactly where I was. In the wilderness where nobody can listen. That's right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Do I have permission to stay here? Everyone's been going to the podium all day. All right. I'm going to stay here. You. Panelists are welcome. Oh. Come, panelists can return. <laughs> Given my theme is collaborative, the more people up here, the better. So I've, I've been working on trying to find uh, language, narrative, for uh, what in the US largely falls under this cooperative federalism discussion. And we've moved a little bit more broadly than cooperative federalism to collaborative federalism and dynamic federalism. And at the international level, we have good governance. And good governance, uh, to some of us, is very broad in scope. And to others, has started to be more anti-corruption oriented. And so I've been writing about good governance for, for a while now, and realizing that perhaps we need a better terminology that meets in the middle. And so I'd like to argue that I, I'm not wedded to what it's called, but, but I'd like to start a discussion that it be called something that everyone agrees upon. And I'm pulling together some themes that have already been part of conversations. So dynamic network governance. Governance already means something in governance discourse. Um, it means something beyond governments. It's broader and, and dynamic in particular has encompassed the notion of inclusivity. And so, you know, much of what I was uh, going to try and pack in has now already been, you know, well freshly uh, put in your, in your um, thought process. And so the, the notion of how do you fit participation into that dynamic. Um, and then networks. Networks are really uh, how to operationalize this process. And it's been talked about all the way back, um, you know, in, in multiple different disciplines, the notion of, uh, you know, either emergence theory or, or, or uh, network, you know, trans 
governmental network theory with Amory Slaughter and, and many, many others, um, have uh, a body of literature already you know, well underway talking about what do networks look like. And, um, and that's ongoing. It's ongoing in the context of uh, it, you know, actually internet, net, social networking. It's, it's um, uh, you know, ongoing in the context of uh, how do entities at the governmental level continue to network uh, with each other. And um, increasingly, we're starting to see conversations about state and non-state networking. And whether or not you call that type two uh, public-private partnerships, I agree that's a fairly limited context, but a very, very, very important one. So I'm trying to look at how to do um, applied sustainability in the context of dynamic network governance to address the climate, energy, water nexus. And you can talk about this with a lot of uh, language that can then um, trigger other conversations that have already been underway. Or you can talk about this in narrative. And throughout the last two days, people have been going back and forth. And some people have really looked at a given um, country perspective, a given personal narrative. And I think it takes both. So I'm going to, to, to stop there in terms of uh, you know, where I'm going with my current writing project and back up and, and um, take a, a literary perspective and say that, to me, Svetlana embodied the notion that I think Shel Silverstein eloquently uh, put into poetry. And I'll quote it to the best of my memory. Um, Listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never haves, then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. Now, for me, I grew up in a context where that was writ large in terms of anything I came up with and wanted to do. And that was in part because I had a father who got on a bus from Kansas City, got off in Mexico, found the Quaker work camp, and picked up a shovel and started digging. And then came back and um, helped integrate movie houses in DC the year before Brown versus Board of Education. And so that, I'll just you know, give those two little snippets of the, the family narrative that, that you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants in a huge way in terms of having gotten to have this um, exposure to some of these very, very complex issues at such an early stage. And so for me, I jumped in in the 80s. And it was in part a matter of some really brilliant people congregating around water. We lived on a river, and there was a dock off the back, um, you know, in the backyard. And UN people from all walks of life, from all different agencies, would just gather show up, park, um, and jump in the river. And so I was able to just, over the years, listen to these dialogues about how are we going to keep Nepali girls from being sold into sex, sex slavery in Bangkok. Um, you know, the, the USF house got shut down because of bomb scare. And, and there wasn't a whole lot of editing going on as to whose ears were impressionable and, and who was listening to these various different conversations. Just. Policy was being hashed out, and it was being hashed out among people who were, like Svetlana, out in nature, trying to rejuvenate, trying to put their pieces back together mentally, so that they could get back into the, the negotiations, whatever the negotiations were that were underway. And they wanted all the perspectives they could get. And you know, to their credit, they weren't uh, taken aback when you know, the likes of me started joining the conversations. They started included me, including me, and then they started handing me the reports they didn't have time to write or, or finish, and asking me to start pre-editing, pre-highlighting, pre-margin noting. And so I got to be, at, at a quite formulative point, a uh, research assistant for the UN head of, uh, the UNICEF head of water, and started um, getting given these, you know, at the time, uh, really intriguing projects. So why don't you write a speech for um, this uh, 
you know, projects underway of how the UN can get involved in uh, in the environment. And it was it was speech writing um, endeavor for the Secretary General. And so I pushed everything aside and I, I you know, started writing a speech. And that led to um, getting involved in, in other ways. And, and as I said, it was right around the time uh, when we were really taking this intergenerational uh, approach seriously. And so I got to be part of the drafting process for Agenda 21, for the Rio Declaration, for the UNFCCC. Um, and, you know, it, it, we were coming up with a terminology for the, the Global Environment Facility, um, working, you know, in the same hallways with the same folks as Bell Abzug and, and um, Al Gore and the children of Wangari Mathai. And at the same time, you were really aware of this isn't very hard for some people. For me, I was hopping a train. It took about an hour and wandering halfway across Manhattan and, and getting to the UN. The tough part was a lot of it was happening at about 2 or 3 AM. And I happened to have parents who didn't care and had already put me on a bus, a public Paris bus at the age of three uh, to get to school. And so they already become very not parental um, in, a, in a pretty unique way. And so by the age of, um, you know, middle teens, uh, being part of this drafting process that was happening around the, the clock pre the first Rio um, was putting together some really important norm building language that is still vibrant. It's still the Rio 10 language that's the base of the Aarhus Convention and it took all the networking possible. Um, and yet it was also very true that it was for the most part uh, white, well-off, educated, inside folks who had the, the capacity to hold the conversation, the, the drive with which to get into the UN, um, you know, the, the chutzpah with which to, to get past the, the significant security, and, and be part of that dialogue. And that chutzpah was certainly uh, true of many of the indigenous communities that were there, who were there for the indigenous forum meetings, and who stayed on for the Commission on Sustainable Development meetings, and they were held back to back. And, and ongoing, it built, and it became more inclusive, and it represented more diverse perspectives, and it grew and grew and grew. But in the process, it became harder to hold this, um, this conversation. The conversation became um, um, much more interesting, but much harder to, to keep all the threads together. Um, in, in the pre-Rio context, when Wangari Mathai, um, in, in her work in Nairobi, ended up getting beaten into a coma by the police, um, that, that news spread so rapidly for, for pre-internet times that everyone at the negotiations knew exactly how Wangari was doing and her daughters were, were with us and scared and we were very, very scared for, for Wangari and we uh, were able to um, be supportive of each other in this not as scary setting that the UN had created in terms of getting together and being able to be a forum for this ongoing discussion, but cognizant that the likes of um, Chico Mendes, Ken uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, the, 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 those that did not make it, and the likes of Wangari Mathai and Amartya Sen, who um, rose to great recognition with Nobel Prize, um, you know, for their both work on the ground, work in the field, and the, in the case of Amartya Sen, amazing ability to take the economic, social, and environmental discussion and integrate it so beautifully. So his, his ability to say that people are agents, people are subjects, at a time when international human rights law was starting to recognize that there was not just um, an object status to being an individual, um, you know, the way Mark Janis taught me, it was, you know, your wristwatch is your object. 
and you as the subject may be a country, and if someone smashes your wristwatch, you have the option whether or not to go and pursue that or not. But if your wristwatch ends up getting to be a subject, if every individual gets to be a subject at international law and can take cases to human rights tribunals, then there's recourse. And, and um, you know, whether it's environmental civil um, citizen suits or whether it's international human rights tribunals, and even the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, um, there, whether there's a binding legal outcome, whether there's compensation, the process of the inclusivity, not only in um, the, the make someone whole or make this habitat whole, but to me, the more profound process of the inclusivity of involving uh, non-state actors in the creation of law so that, that sovereignty becomes qualified not only in recognizing rights and duties to, to environmental integrity and to um, you know, human rights, but also that states don't have a monopoly on moving forward in very complex areas and trying to create some level of, of coherence, um, understand where there are conflicts, understand where there are co-benefits among economic, social, human rights, uh, and, and environmental uh, fragmented aspects of international law, all very important. We now have over 500 multi, multilateral environmental treaties, but the states were willing to recognize that there are non-state actor expertise, non-state actor expertise clearly in creating water infrastructure. Local municipalities are not always the best um, situated entities to actually put the pipes in place. But private uh, engineers are not always the best entities to do the oversight. Um, the temptations for, for revenue um, stream you know, maximizing are, are, are strong. And so those public-private partnerships that we're spending so much time talking about really need to uh, retain this notion of oversight, retain this notion of there being a monitoring process, there being an implementation process, and that legitimacy comes through um, civil society participation in the creation of the, the um, solutions and the integrated solutions where it's sensible to integrate and the um, complementary solutions where it's sensible to be complementary. We've got extraordinarily complex international economic law, even if you just look at the WTO. But now that it has splintered into all these bits, we've got investment law that is mind-numbingly complex. And yet we do have new case law coming out of the WTO context that does start to talk about coherence. Um, and they're the one with the judicial body. So we now have um, energy access coming, uh, it, it, unfortunately, into the trade context through the um, solar dumping case, where we've been trying for years in the, in the climate negotiations, in the climate um, context, uh, you know, from pre-rail, I was with UNICEF in Bali, I was with IUCN in, in uh, Copenhagen, Cancun, and, and recently in Durban. Um, we have not been able to, uh, in game theory, get the collective action problem solved to all move forward together um, in a way that can ramp up infant renewables, address the, the disparate um, uh, subsidies issue between um, fossil fuel subsidization versus um, infant renewable subsidization. And as a result, it has now landed in the WTO context. And it's about to come down as a WTO case. There isn't another court system for the environmental context. We have New South Wales with a court. We have um, Vermont with court. We have emerging environmental courts. We have uh, ordinary citizens who have looked to their constitutional courts or looked to their uh, human rights tribunals, but we don't have anything comparable. And um, so moving from resigned to resilient, moving uh, from, you know, to emerging ethics, uh, economics, and environment, it makes sense to try and find the ways in which applied sustainability um, can occur. It's, it's, we are a long way from the international community truly embracing all aspects of sustainability. But 
we, post Rio, the road from Rio, the next step is an effort to look uh, towards sustainability goals and governance. And so the discussion underway amongst NGOs, amongst the, the nation states, amongst the IGOs, um, the inter intergovernmental organizations, is what, um, as the Millennium Development Goals um, start uh, waning, you know, with, with our 2015 targets, how can we seamlessly start building in um, sustainability goals? And can they look like an expansion of uh, environmental impact statements to involve environmental, social, and economic um, integrated impact statements? And, and how can you balance some of those um, objectives without always having one of the dimensions um, disproportionately not represented because their international institutional stature is not as high because they don't have a judicial branch uh, and for a myriad of other reasons because there isn't as much of a recognition of, of the revenue stream. There's a, there's a beginning discussion of green economies and uh, ecosystem services, but at the end of the day, um, the default discussion towards the economic end of things um, continues to occur. And yet, if, if economic language is in fact the language of governance, um, then there are still uh, means by which to continue that conversation, but have greater coherence among the human rights aspects and the social aspects. So I'd like to just end on another um, uh, piece of poetry by one of my other favorite poems, uh, poets Emily Dickinson. Um, hope is the thing with feathers that sits within the soul, uh, that sings the song without the words and never stops at all. So I challenge everyone to help through dynamic governance, um, you know, network governance, whatever you want to call it, to continue this approach to answer the question, what does hope look like? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Marco Sorellano with the Center for International Environmental Law. Uh, I am delighted uh, to be here today. It's an honor to celebrate uh, Svetlana. Svetlana and uh, I worked uh, closely on a number of issues. Uh, she was always generous with her time, uh, mostly in answering emails. Uh, when you're in a civil society doing NGO advocacy and have very little time to go over reports and the like, <laughs> Having an ally in academia that can uh, address questions and bounce back ideas and uh, review reports and even edits and contribute language is very, very welcome. Uh, Svetlana had a vision, a vision uh, uh, concerning access rights. Access rights have the potential to recast sustainable development, uh, a, a process of development uh, that's inclusive, that's respectful of human rights. Access rights are also central to environmental democracy. And environmental democracy, it's been said it's a northern agenda, or at times it's a southern agenda, or a western agenda, or a, an eastern agenda. It's a human rights and environmental agenda. And I, I guess my role in this panel uh, was uh, due to the work that uh, in the Rio Plus 20 process uh, we were able to do. I was. Uh, uh, the legal advisor to the Chilean delegation, and in that capacity, the delegation was able to persuade 10 countries of the Latin America Caribbean region to issue a declaration expressing a commitment to a process that, uh, that will explore the feasibility, so these are all very weak terms, the feasibility of an instrument in the Latin America Caribbean region on access rights. From the perspective of civil society, nothing less than a legally binding instrument providing for access rights that can secure environmental democracy in the region, that can strengthen institutions, will be acceptable. So I'm here not speaking in any personal capacity, uh, but as a CL advocate. Uh, rather than uh, elaborating further on access rights and the Rio Plus 20 process, however, I thought I would, uh, uh, I would uh, give a brief account of what has happened in Geneva in the, in the last week or so in connection with environmental rights. 
Uh, I was uh, in Geneva for, these last, uh, for, the, for the last 10 days working with Yahoo's Compliance Committee, with the Human Rights Council, and with the Basel Convention, and I thought that an update on some of the interface issues between toxics and human rights uh, would, uh, would be interesting for, for this audience. Uh, the first point is that uh, after many years of trying, the Human Rights Council has finally established a special procedure on human rights in the environment. After 18 years of trying, a special procedure is a tool of the Council that allows for uh, attention to be brought to a specific issue. This mandate will allow for uh, this individual to focus on the relationship between human rights and environment, lay the basis of legal obligations, and move the international community in a global dialogue channeled in the Human Rights Council with a view to uh, the recognition at the global level of the human right to live in a healthy environment. We expect that this may happen at the end of the mandate in three more years or perhaps at the end of the renewal of the mandate in six more years. Professor John Knox from Wake Forest University has been appointed to this mandate and we're uh, uh, very excited about that opening. There's also movement in connection with the special procedure on toxics. Let's recall that in, in 1995, uh, this special procedure was established uh, uh, the request of, uh, of the African group mainly. The African group was uh, concerned that uh, uh, industrial waste from northern countries was being dumped in the south. This was a voted mandate. It was a deeply controversial mandate, a north-south split uh, mirroring international environmental politics. Uh, the dumping of hazardous waste, the South being used as the garbage bin of the North. The North opposed this mandate for many years until in 2011, what uh, then became the Council, replacing the politicized Commission, uh, re-adopted the mandate by consensus. So it's not that controversial politicized mandate anymore, but there is a consensus that there is a human rights dimension not just to hazardous waste, and this is the second part of it, to the life cycle approach of chemicals. So there are many opportunities that arise in connection with this special procedure which we're hoping to, uh, to further capitalize on. In this specific period of sessions that concluded uh, yesterday, I wish I was here yesterday, but I was on my way here, 18 hours, uh, that fly very fast. <laughs> uh, a new mandate holder has been uh, appointed to that position and um, yeah, I'm delighted to announce to you or to congratulate Professor Mark Palamertz to that position. <laughs> this is an appointment by the Council uh, it, which is, follows a, a um, a political process involving the president and the regional groupings and also a, uh, a technical evaluation of merits of the candidates that are presented by a consultative group, uh, so it's a quite rigorous uh, process. And I'll take the opportunity to already uh, give the new special rapporteur some homework, or rather to uh, put some issues under his considerations. The, this consideration. the first one is to consider how to inject a rights-based approach to the international chemicals agenda. As we know, there are ongoing negotiations leading to a treaty on mercury. Human Rights Watch and others have tried to inject uh, human rights issues into these negotiations, so far not with much success. Uh, it has been said that these negotiations are quite broad, mercury everywhere, and they need to be narrowed down. At the same time, it's essential for a human rights approach to be injected into them. Uh, second, there are uh, three conventions that are operating now uh, in tandem, as it were. Synergies, the Secretariat uh, in UNEP is uh, looking at the three conventions in parallel. They will be meeting next uh, uh, April in, in Geneva. There is a question on how to incorporate a rights-based approach to the operation of these conventions. There are questions of transparency and public participation, making sure that we don't fall down to the lowest denominator, but instead seize on best practices with respect to access rights. So that in the context of injecting a rights-based approach to the international chemicals agenda, a second point is to document the human rights violations that result uh, from ship breaking. 
And this is perhaps a segue to uh, talk about uh, the Basel Convention, which also kept us busy uh, last week. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are two issues that I wish to uh, highlight there. And I will also interject some legal questions uh, since we're in law school. The first one is, is ship breaking. What does this practice refer to? Human rights and the environment are subsidizing the global economy. What does the global economy rest on? It rests on seaborne trade, trade that takes place on freighters and that depends on fossil fuels. What happens to these vessels once their life has come to an end? Most of the vessels are being taken for recycling, for scrapping in the beaches of India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan in what is so-called the beaching method, high tide, the vessel is run to the, into the beach, low tide, workers without safety gear or otherwise uh, uh, protective uh, equipment come and begin to dismantle it with torches. Now, this would not be an issue if it were not for the very toxic wastes that are found on these vessels. PCBs, uh, asbestos, lead, cadmium, heavy metals. Uh, it is uh, frequently reported every week uh, workers lose their lives. Uh, there are long-term health implications, and there are implications for the local and global environment as well. Persistent organic pollutants, when released, persist, migrate, and affect everyone. So this is a huge problem. What's happening with it? Uh, there's a coalition of organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, coming together in the shipbreaking platform, organizations from India, from Bangladesh, from, from Europe, from the United States and others. And uh, with CL, we have come to the Basel Convention and argued that Basel should take stock of this issue because at the end of the day, we're in the face of a transboundary movement of hazardous waste. Let's recall it. it's the Basel Convention on transboundary movement of hazardous waste and its disposal. And yet, here we see one of the problems with the increasing fragmentation of international law. Basel has said, well, but these are ships. It's very hard to apply Basel to ships. How do we determine what's the state of export? And how do we know when the ship becomes a waste? Perhaps we should let the International Maritime Organization deal with sea-related issues, shipping, marine. So, Basel, land, IMO, MARPOL, the convention that protects the oceans, sea. Where does the land and the sea meet? There's a, there's a gap there that internationally we haven't been able to close. The IMO has negotiated and adopted what is known as the Hong Kong Convention on Ship Recycling, dominated by shipping indust industries that, in our analysis, does not establish a, an equivalent level of control and protection to the Basel Convention. The problem of ship breaking is expected to peak in the coming five to 10 years. It is estimated that there are 50,000 ships above 500 gross tonnage. Of these, about 1,670 ships are decommissioned and taken for scrapping every year. This figure will increase with the phase out of single halt tankers. We're talking about an industry of roughly $1.5 billion a year. How are we going to deal with this massive problem is the question that we're trying to address. So far, the Basel Convention has not responded to the extent that we would, uh, we're expecting that it must. So far, the IMO is legitimating a practice without really addressing the environmental and human rights dimensions effectively. There's another angle of this problem that's worth highlighting, which is that the European Commission, or the European Union more generally, uh, which is generally uh, an ally when it comes to uh, uh, Basel and hazardous waste issues, has uh, found it quite expedient to also get rid of its ships um, uh, the, and uh, send them off to India and Bangladesh and Pakistan. And how can it do that legally when EU law, in particular the waste shipment regulations, implements Basel, including the Basel ban, which is a provision that uh, was adopted within the convention that prohibits the export of hazardous waste from industrialized countries to the south. Not yet in force, but in force in EU law. 
the Commission, the EU Commission, has put out a proposal uh, a couple of weeks ago to change the EU waste shipments regulation to exclude vessels. Can the EU delegate unilaterally from its Basel obligations? That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> Cannot. Of course, that's the argument that we're putting forward, but this is a, a, a controversy, a fight that's coming up in Brussels in the coming months, and we expect um, things to heat up there uh, very soon. A second point on the, on the Basel Convention that I think is worth uh, uh, talking about today is, uh, is uh, relates to the, oh, it's gone, the Probo Koala, the vessel uh, operated by this company, Trafigura, from the UK, with a subsidiary in the Netherlands. Some of you may recall this incident. There it is. In 2006, the vessel, obtained coconafta from Pemex in Mexico and the US and began to conduct uh, industrial operations in the seas, washing and refining the fuel. Then it had to find a place where to offload the hazardous waste and it, was, uh, it went to Amsterdam uh, the, on July 2006 where it was quoted a figure of uh, around, uh, what is it, uh, seven euros per, per, per cubic meter. But when the Dutch contractors that were going to uh, handle the waste really saw what was the waste about, they raised the price significantly. And at that moment, some of the waste that had been offloaded began to be unloaded on the barge again. and. Dutch authorities allowed the vessel to leave. Now that, again, is a violation of Dutch law. It's a criminal act. It's a violation of EU law. It's a, a violation of the Basel Convention, one could argue, uh, which criminalizes uh, illegal transboundary movement. What did the vessel do next? It went to Estonia, and then, perhaps I can go down. It went to Togo and then went to Nigeria trying to figure out what to do with this waste, and it ended up in Cote d'Ivoire, where in Abidjan, uh, the waste was offloaded and dumped in 18 si points in the, in the city of Abidjan. 100,000 people affected in their environmental rights for years. There's still no information on what that waste was specifically containing, which chemicals, so that has uh, been an obstacle to providing health care. Many people died, dozens of people died as a result of the pollution. This type of situation is a human rights and environment issue that has led Amnesty International and Greenpeace joint forces to produce this report which is available online. They asked me to go to the Basel Convention Open-Ended Working Group, which met last week in Geneva, to address this problem because the Secretariat put out an analysis uh, of the Basel Convention as it relates to waste generated on ships that uh, doesn't really get at this point. Uh, that uh, that uh, study by the Secretariat uh, was, um, concludes that uh, Basel does not apply to waste generated on board a ship. Now this is a complex legal issue that involves the interaction of MARPO, which is the IMO convention that deals with discharge into the marine environment of waste produced by the normal operations of a vessel, interaction of MARPO and Basel, which controls transboundary movement of hazardous waste and contains other obligations on the generation and the environmentally sound management of wastes. There are questions of the customary law of the sea, the law of the sea convention, and there is also issues of treaty interpretation, codified in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, and in customary law. We believe that the analysis of the Secretariat is incorrect for a number of reasons. First, and this is, this is the, legal, the legal issue, when it comes to transboundary movement, the relevant operative term is marine area. The travaux 
proprietor. So the proprietary works of Basel indicates that this term was introduced in Basel to align itself with the new marine areas that had been recognized in the law of the sea. Let's recall that in the law of the sea, we have the territorial sea, and then also, as a matter of customary law, codified in the law of the sea convention, the exclusive economic zone up to 200 nautical miles where the state, coastal state exercises jurisdiction over environmental issues. So the Basel Convention negotiated after the Law of the Sea con uh, Convention, the, the third conference, the UN Conference on the Law of the Sea, uh, wanted to align itself with these concepts. Yet the study of the Secretariat concludes that waste produ generated on a vessel in the territorial sea is not subject is not, a mar is not produced in a marine area. So the territorial sea is not a marine area? Is the exclusive economic zone not a marine area? Uh, I am surprised that, uh, for example, the State Department uh, of the US has gone along with this interpretation so far. I don't think they will anymore, now that uh, we've put out our critique, but maybe that's wishful thinking. <laughs> I'm also surprised that some of the countries that fought hard to get the exclusive economic zone recognized as a norm of customary law have gone with this interpretation. There's also the question of what does it mean, what does the word party mean? I mean these are legal interpretative issues. You know? What does party, what is the state, the notion of the state? This is a question that relates to obligations on generation and an environmentally sound management. The position taken by the Secretariat is that echoing the European Union, Norway, and Canada, is that state is a territorial mass. Well, what, what, happens, what happened with the territorial sea suddenly? It vanished. The, the, the sea is not a, an element of, uh, of the territory of the state? That's, that's, uh, that's striking. But beyond that rhetorical kind of humorous uh, intervention, I would say that the Looking at the state as a geographical mass of land and appertaining territorial sea is a construct of the 19th century, the second half of the 20th century. It's codified in the 1933 convention, Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States. But the contemporary notion of the state is not just a physical geographical mass. It is a, it is a recognition that the state exercises sovereign rights, jurisdiction, responsibilities. It is a legal construct that understands the state as a subject of international law, subject of rights and responsibilities. This position then calls for a jurisdictional approach to the interpretation of party, which brings in flag state jurisdiction, which is a huge loophole in the law, in the law of the sea. Flags of convenience, open registries and, and the like. I'm running out of time, so I will wrap up by saying that uh, the open-ended working group uh, concluded with a decision that uh, does not adopt the analysis of the flawed analysis of the Secretariat, with much respect, uh, and defers the question to the Conference of the Parties 11 uh, that will meet in April next year. So to conclude, UN progress uh, in Geneva on the human rights and environment is quite slow. When a victory is a deferral of a decision, uh, it can be quite discouraging. At the same time, we are seeing that new mechanisms have emerged with the special procedure on human rights in the environment and with the expanded, uh, expanded special procedure on toxics and with the new special rapporteur. Thank you very much. be doing the question portion of the panel. Just wait for Mr. May. Oh. Yes, sir. This is uh, for Marco. Um, can you tell me how it is um, the last part of your uh, discussion uh, that uh, sovereignty only includes a massive land Any, uh, I, I know a massive 
that's the, the, it's a, the, it almost sounds like the kind of rhetorical question that I was asking uh, uh, in my presentation. The, the continental shelf being the, the submerged uh, extension of the continent under the seas uh, might be relevant in, these, uh, in this discussion as well when it comes to drilling platforms and the like. Now, uh, when it, the, the focus of this study, however, uh, comes out of, the, of a request by the Ivory Coast and the Netherlands for greater clarity on the interface between Marple and Basel with respect to waste generated on a ship. So when it is, so if we're dealing with ships, we're talking about the territorial sea and the exclusive economic zone until 200 nautical miles. In, in, in my mind, there is no question that the territorial sea is an element of the territory of the state. That's well settled in international law. And yet the analysis of the Secretariat ignores this. Why does it do that? Well, there's a matter of speculation, but um, it, the analysis does point to certain practical difficulties in applying the Basel Convention over ships. It notes that ships move around, so it's very hard to control them. It also notes that if the transboundary uh, movement uh, procedures of, uh, of the Basel Convention were to be applied on ships, it could be that uh, any delay in obtaining consent from the state of ex from the state of import or transit states could result in a situation where the containers of the waste begin to overflow and that poses a risk to the marine environment. It also talks about practical difficulties relating to dumping, encourage, potentially encouraging dumping in the, high, in the, in the seas. Now, uh, again, another rhetorical point perhaps is that there's no rule in international law that says that uh, practical difficulties in complying with an obligation are either an interpretative criterion or a reason to do away with an obligation. On the contrary, international obligations are established to address reality and control it. I'll stop there. Well, I can answer the, that question under the logic of, of the Secretariat's analysis, which is that the obligation pertaining to transboundary movement does not apply to waste generated on ships. Hague regulations. <laughs> well, I, I think you could at least, you know, not win your entire case, but you could speak to the Geneva Convention and the Hague regulations to, to a small degree. In the gray, sure. Sure. This is actually your question, um, When it comes to uh, participation, uh, earlier on today you were talking about how the population of Louisiana um, were hostile. Environmental laws, you know, after the BP spill. So, would you, would you 
up to, you see it as sometimes a hindrance for the, for the populations that are so invested in detrimental you know, activities? I'm not sure that I can talk about that. Um, I'm not sure I understand the, the question at the very end. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's a great question, and here's the paradox, right? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, perhaps uh, a good deal of those folks uh, might have a different opinion if they actually had reliable information. If they had, and I'm, Oliver, you might have a different point of view about people from Louisiana. <laughs> I don't know, but, but um, and and if there were if there were opportunities to to participate in meaningful ways, it might change points of view. If there were opportunities to have access to justice, but not for everyone, not under all conditions, not everywhere. But there's this, uh, you know, and again, this is in keeping with something that I recall Svetlana saying at some point. You know, there are three things that we can do as in civil society when it comes to the environmental movement that, that are essential anyway. That is, first, to get informed. Second, is to get involved. And third, get into court. Okay, so. That maybe this gets back to that. I mean, I, I uh, maybe it's a, fu a fundamental faith in the human spirit, uh, along with uh, human rights. I think if better information will lead to better decision making, not only at the uh, the meta level um, or the mega level, but also at the meta level. A gentleman in the white shirt. And I think it's context specific. I mean, some of my recent work has been looking at um, partnerships for creating breakout solutions and innovation for um, solar cookers. And, and there, if you're uh, working with local communities who have yeah, local I'm needs. Solar cookers and that stuff. That's just not working. I mean, it's, 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 it's just where we ought to be going with renewables, but it's not where these fights are. Um, um, they're much more. Well, for instance, 
Kinsar Awiwa, and I, I believe, in, in my involvement in Amnesty International, he was the first environmental defender that Amnesty International did a full-blown campaign on. So the, the integration of the international environmental community and human rights community to take the, the Shell Nigeria oil context and now his son, you know, ended up in government. But it works in some context, and it's, it is very much a double-edged sword. It, it, it can be highly problematic in other contexts. There is a, there is a, a legalistic uh, answer to that, looking at the formal documents, and then there is the big picture of uh, what is the real impact uh, that uh, a special rapporteur, a special procedure can have. Uh, on, the, on the former, the, this is a tool of the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is an organ that reports to the UN General Assembly, and so it is a, is embodies the international community's ability to come together in a common vocabulary to address human rights issues in the world, generally speaking. The special procedure is a specific tool to look in particular at a given situation or a given country. There are thematic mandates or country-specific mandates. Uh, the Special Rapporteur on Toxics or the Enjoyment of Human Rights relating to the disposal of hazardous waste, it has a long name, um, <clears throat> is then going to bring attention to that specific theme. The specific competences of the Special, the, the, the special Rapporteur are defined in the resolution of the Council that establishes the procedure and the mandate holder will execute that mandate. Now, there's always some room for the mandate holder to interpret that resolution and uh, define priorities, determine scope, and the like. So that's the, the formal, legalistic even perspective on that. Yeah. Well, in terms of specific personal motivations, those vary, of course, but uh, it, it, the, the, the form... Motivation, I mean, I mean, what are the resources available? Yes, so, so the, that part, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, is the secretariat, as it were, that offers support to these tools. And uh, the, there is a special unit within that office uh, for special procedures that provides the support. There is, an, uh, there is a budget very small budget that uh, allows for country visits depending on the resolution establishing the procedure. There is also a budget that provides for a staff person to support the mandate. But the mandate is unpaid, so it's from a voluntary basis, and it's, uh, so it's, it's trying to do a lot with very little resources, really. Um, the lady in the back row.
so is it a common provision in, in constitutions around the globe to provide opportunities to petition the government in environmental matters, including yeah, climate change? There's no decision making process happening. Can people try to create a decision making process to affirmatively act to protect the rights? Okay, uh, let me ask, let me answer that in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, specifically about whether there are specific provisions or whether it's very common to have specific provisions for a right to participate um, that's recognized constitutionally uh, concerning environmental matters, the answer is no. That's not very common. Uh, that's first group. Second group, do many countries have specific provisions that provide rights to participate in decision making, not just about environmental matters, but as a general matter in their constitution? That cohort is more fulsome. Um, third, uh, countries that have statutory recognition or provide statutory basis uh, for public participation, that's a, a, an even greater cohort. Um, so the constitutional component of that is, is this, or about environmental matters tends to be the smallest right now. I'm not aware of any, I'm not aware of it, maybe you guys are, I mean, uh, if any particular constitutional, statutory, regulatory provision at an international, national, subnational, local level that gets to your, to your very first point about rights to information concerning um, government decision making about climate change. I mean, maybe it exists. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering more just if there's a general right to petition government to act, not even specifically with respect to climate change, but like what you're talking about, the right to petition the government This is perhaps corollary, but the creation coming out of the first Rio of the nine major groups, and you've got women, youth, uh, farmers, researchers, that get to be ongoing and participatory in the climate negotiations, in the um, persistent organic pollutants, in Basel, in, in, a, in a myriad of different um, contexts in which they get to consult with their state counterparts. And so, um, at these various different ongoing negotiations, uh, you will often get, get invited by your own state um, to have consultations before they enter the next round of negotiations. They want to know what their um, non-state actor counterparts in their own constituencies, in their own nation states or EU region, are, are thinking and networking and, and, you know, what they've come up with. Um, so it, it varies uh, to, to a great degree. Uh, and you get, you know, change agents like Desmond Tutu uh, talking about um, adaptation apartheid, and that can really re-energize the adaptation conversation in a way where it may have reached a very low level of, of dialogue among the, the state actors in the official negotiations. And so it depends on who's talking, it depends on what they're saying, if they've got a Nobel Price um, and they're part of a whole movement like Mary Robinson's climate justice movement, then then you can shift the conversation fairly quickly, at, as at strategic points in the negotiations. Whether it's happening to the same degree at the nation state level, um, I, I I would say perhaps not to the same degree. Can I follow up on that? I've, I've had a few seconds to think about it, Julia. So sorry. Um, well, uh, at, the, at, at the U.S. level, uh, again, you have, starting at the top, you know, we have, uh, I, I wonder, again, maybe some of you would be dismissive of this, I don't know, but I wonder whether we've ad adequately um, developed jurisprudence concerning the First Amendment, right to assembly and right to petition. Uh, again, there'll be arguments about that, but Carl Copeland recently wrote about that as well. He, he thinks that uh, Article Three standing jurisprudence is unconstitutional <laughs> because it's in conflict with the First Amendment. Um, at the, uh, at the um, statutory level, there's the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, ZIG has, we were talking about this earlier, ZIG has more ideas about that, Section 553C and 553E. But, yeah, and, um, and then here's another one, just to, you know, to throw into you know, a quiver. Um, how about procedural due process? You know, with procedural due process, you need these two components. You have to have individualized decision making and they have to have a deprivation of life, sorry guys, but life, liberty, um, or property. So um, I, I hope maybe, or maybe, it's, again, maybe it's a pipe dream to develop that kind of jurisprudence at the federal and the state level to provide more opportunity for participation um, in environmental decision making. And let me leave you with this. Um, the question that I asked at the beginning is whether it's all worth the coin. I mean, my, what I'm interested in is whether to supplement all these other measures 
there should be a global constitutional right to information participation and access to justice. Um, and even maybe if, if there is that or even barring that, how about at the national level? Is it worth taking the conversation first constitutionally to, to ensure that those rights are uh, respected? Um, because if not now, when? Particularly about climate change and if not about environmental human rights, about what? Can I add a footnote to, to that, to that uh, which is that um, in Professor Hauck's book, uh, there's a chapter, the last one, on, on the Trillium case in, in Chile. That case, a part of it, went to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. It ended up there, and it concerned access to information. And there, the court uh, recognized that Article 13 of the American Convention, which you cited in your presentation, Jim, uh, embodies a right of access to information uh, that's held by public authorities. After that decision was rendered, uh, the European Court of Human Rights had the opportunity to hear a similar case, the Tarsa Sac case in northern Romania, and it came out with a similar construct abandoning decades of different interpretations that where the European Court had held freedom of expression does not impose an obligation on the government to disclose information. It does not establish a right of uh, access to information based on those two precedents, as well as the right of access to environmental information that has been developed in human rights and environment jurisprudence in all three uh, regional systems. The Human Rights Committee of the UN that oversees implementation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it's a lot of words, uh, excuse me, the, in, uh, in its most recent general comment on uh, freedom of expression uh, last year, recognized a global self-standing right of access to information, which then can be used, as you're pointing out. Well, I hate to do this, but we've run out of time. Yeah, just no, 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 I mean, if, if, if you're in a world where you can't even ask, uh, it's pretty pathetic. So I, I guess I would say uh, there's got to be a way. Well, if you're running into SUA, uh, um, you can petition for someone to act. And it used to be that a failure to act then could be charged as being uh, uh, under the layer of arbitrary capricious. We all know that. After Also, the SEAL reports, the Amnesty International campaigns, the, the you know, it's it's the NGO um, various different mobilizing of norm building that that does create the agenda to some degree. Uh, may I say one other thing? Look, if they're going to say, they may say no for sure, no question about it, and then there's an, an issue whether you can enforce it. But just because they're going to say no doesn't mean you shouldn't try. And, if you don't, and when you don't try, you're saying no for them. But so I say petition uh, and go for Let it. Let the lady speak that because she doesn't. Yes, I'm well, sorry. I just think the question that Jen really is how many constitutions are on the world? How, I know there's constitutions that put on the government the duty to protect the environment. And so how many of those are enforceable? And I think that's a much smaller number than the number that have the duty. But I think that's the, the number that you need. Yeah. 
Yeah, those, those duty provisions, and, and, and again, you know, some of you might know specific cases, but the, there are dozens of countries with constitutions that have the provision that you just described, that it's the duty of the government to do thus and so about the environment. Also, individual duties, the duty of every citizen to do thus and so. Those aren't enforceable. Well, are they enforceable from anywhere? I'm not sure. Not that I've seen. And, and let me just, to, to follow up on something that Bill said, and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Um, my kids do it all the time. I wish we would do it more, you know, as a country and as people uh, uh, worldwide, perhaps. Like Bill said, why not ask? What's the worst that can happen? Please join me in thanking.